So the purpose of my case report um, was to describe a balance and functional mobility focus intervention uh, following intramedullary nailing of a tibial fracture in an elderly adult. Um, so to start off with falls, they're, they're a big deal in, in, uh, older, in the older population. It's a leading cause of fatal injury among the elderly, it's greater than 65 years of age. Uh, it's the leading cause of hospital admissions among elderly with more than 700,000 per year. Uh, there's a 10 times higher risk for falling among the elderly, and uh, falling once will double the risk of future falls. Um, so with falls, you obviously have fractures. Um, long bones, such as the humerus, femur, uh, tibia are some of the main ones. Um, they're the most common in the elderly. Uh, a sarcopenia, which wasting or uh, loss of muscle mass that goes along with the aging process increasing bone uh, fragility, impaired healing with all the comorbidities as people age, uh, combined with age-related osteopenia or even uh, osteoporosis um, become risk factors for fra uh, fractures. Um, fracture non-union is higher in the elderly population. And then uh, specifically for this case, distal tibia fractures are a little more difficult to manage due to their proximity to the ankle joint and the fibula. Um, so what the gold standard for Tibial fracture treatment uh, is intramedullary nailing. Uh, it's pretty much an internal splint to stabilize the fracture. Uh, with, the, with the IM nailing, you have better alignment, which will give you faster healing. You have earlier weight bearing, earlier joint motion, higher union rates. Uh, doesn't mess with the soft uh, tissue healing around the fracture site, and you have a lower rate of uh, infections. Some of the cons with IM nailing is increased knee pain, and when I show you one of the pictures you'll see why, or when I tell you about it, you'll see why. You have a higher incidence of angular malunion. So if you think about rotation in the transverse plane uh, with, the, with the fracture healing, it's not always, um, it's obviously the goal to get it uh, aligned right, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and then also a possible leg, leg, leg length discrepancy. Uh, so just to let you know, I, I really wanted to get a gruesome tibia intramedullary nailing. Um, with the hammer, but they're all like 30 minutes long. So instead, I got you a nice animated PG femur, which is very similar. Um, so we have the uh, guide wire inserted into the long bone, this femur, but we'll talk about the tibia in a minute. Um, they'll use a drill to ream it, uh, ream the hole to allow the rod when they, when they place it to go in a little more smoothly, a little more room. So then after that, the nail is obviously inserted with the guide wire straight down through the long bone into the intramedullary canal and then uh, hammered into place like so. And then locking screws are placed uh, proximally and distally to hold the, uh, the nail in place. So that was a femur. To kind of show you what they do with the tibia, in the picture on the left, uh, what they do is they'll make the incision and split the patellar tendon and go straight through the tibial plateau. So you can kind of see why there might be some knee pain. Um, and then in some of these fracture, uh, some of these x-rays of the fractures, you can kind of see what it would look like with the locking screws. And it's not uncommon to have pain uh, where they intruded the screws as well. That was pretty good. I wish that would have played in my intro. <laughs> um, so rehabilitation following the IM nail placement. Uh, there's a, 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 a huge, huge, huge lack of literature focusing on, on rehabilitation following a tibia fracture with IM nail fixation. Um, the current evidence of rehabilitation following uh, IM nail fixation is with the femur fracture. Uh, they described a, a pretty successful program focusing on weight-bearing progression, gait training, balance, proprioception, uh, endurance, uh, progressive resistant exercises, and range of motion exercises. Um, why did I choose balance and functional mobility to focus on? Um, because everyday activities 
involve balance. Um, they involve weight bearing, changing your base of support, and when you introduce an injury, all that's thrown off. I mean, I'm, I'm balancing right now. It's easy for me because I don't have injury. I'm healthy, but for someone with uh, a huge rod in a leg in a, in a boot, that's not, it's, it, it kind of, it's kind of a new thing for them. Um, gait training and balance training under similar conditions uh, with what elderly adults encounter in community and household uh, everyday life is shown to be a very effective method of um, training. Increase, there's increased evidence supporting balance and task specific and functional training to minimize disability and decrease risk of future falls. Um, functional or task specific exercises is shown to improve uh, activities of daily living and in some studies comparing that to the traditional impairment oriented exercises of just your your uh, strengthening and range of motion um, has shown that in the elderly population there's more physical activity. Um, so my hypothesis was that focusing on balance of functional mobility in an elderly adult during rehabilitation from tibial intramedullary nail placement will allow for a decreased risk of falls and an increased level of functional independence. Um, so my case description, my patient was an 86-year-old male at a skilled nursing facility. He had a non-displaced distal tibia and fibula uh, fracture during a fall while ascending the stairs. The fibula was um, not operated on, left alone. It's not a primary weight-bearing bone, so the doctor chose to leave it alone. He had the open reduction internal fixation of the tibia with the uh, uh, nail placement. He was on weight-bearing as tolerated uh, protocol and controlled ankle movement boot, uh, called a cam boot. We'll talk about it a little bit, but that bothered me because he was given that probably two and a half weeks after the uh, after he started physical therapy. So he had been in tennis shoes for the first two weeks post surgery, doing weight bearing stuff, and then they randomly added that. Uh, but he was independent and living alone pre injury with no assistive devices, and his goals were to regain his balance, walk alone, uh, negotiate a staircase, and return to independent living. The intervention was five days a week for four weeks, a total of 20 sessions. Each session was approximately 60 minutes long. Some were 75, some were 35. It was really uh, not up to me, but uh, the progression during the intervention was based on pretty much on the level of assistance that he needed during the activities that we did, how much cueing he needed, whether verbal or tactile, um, and self-reported pain or fatigue levels. We had a pretty good relationship, I like to think, so we I could kind of tell when he needed a break, he would he felt comfortable telling me when. Um, so we focused on simulating household and community tasks in a safe and controlled environment. Um, so for gait training, we worked on level uh, surface ambulation, uneven surfaces on cobblestone, on bricks. I was fortunate enough to be at a skilled nurse facility that had what they called a village, which had like uneven surface areas with ramps, curbs. Um, in that picture, you can see the car that's in the building, that's in the facility, so you can practice that type of thing. Uh, we practice curb navigation, stair negotiation, uh, balance training with and without upper extremity support. Um, we would try and test him a little bit with both hands on the walker, one hand on the walker, no hands with me guarding. Uh, we did a little beanbag toss with functional reaching, having to reach across the body, pick up a beanbag, throw it at random locations, uh, functional reach just towards they had a market where you could have to reach for a banana or an apple. So we'd focus on that challenging as ba balance. Uh, balloon tapping, which is just kind of reaction, uh, reaction balance. Ball toss, same type of thing. And then uh, focus a little bit on single leg stance uh, with toe taps on a step, just having to control one foot tapping on a step, one foot come off. Um, functional activities, we had your bed mobility and your transfers working on supine to sit. Uh, eventually getting to you know sit to stand transferring from the recumbent bicycle to uh, re transferring to a wheelchair transferring to a low mat transferring to a toilet uh, just all sorts of different things to work on all the different uh, surfaces he would have to transfer to when he was discharged uh, therapeutic exercise we did a lot of strengthening as well we did you know mini squats on our quads um, hip abduction hip adduction we did some um, we try to do some ankle strengthening uh, some endurance on the recumbent bike. We did some active range of motion with um, what you would say the BAPS board, uh, wobble board, uh, ankle alphabet, those type of things to get his ankle moving because he was in the cam boot during all weight bearing, but he also wore it pretty much all the time, even if you told him not to. He was in it 20 hours a day. Uh, so 
Um, outcome measures, we, I use the Berg balance scale to assess static balance, dynamic balance, and fall risk. I also use total distance ambulated, stair, amount of stairs negotiated, uh, the functional transferability, and assistance level required for functional tasks as my outcome measures. Uh, those other ones are not as are not mentioned in the literature as much, but they directly represent the functional activities that are required by the patient in order to be an independent community-dwelling adult. Um, Berg, uh, it's good to know that with that it has excellent reliability and validity in the literature. A change of eight points uh, on the scale is required to reveal a genuine change. Uh, and then they have their own tiers for low fall risk, medium fall risk, and high fall risk. So. Initially, he couldn't do the Berg balance at all due to pain, due to lack of balance. At two weeks, we, uh, re we tried to retest. He scored a 29, which uh, I believe was medium fall risk. Uh, at four weeks at discharge, he was at a 49, which is a 20-point difference, which is uh, very meaningful, and it put him in the low fall risk tier. Uh, ambulation distance before fatigue. Initially, he was able to walk 40 feet with contact guard or minimal assist. Uh, at two weeks, he was able to go 230. This is with rolling walker. Uh, he was able to go 230 feet with standby assist. And then during, at discharge, he was able to ambulate 300 feet with the rolling walker with modified independence, meaning he could do it himself. He just took a little longer. Uh, stairs negotiated. Initially, couldn't do it at all. Two weeks, 13 stairs up and down with contact guard assist. And that's with bilateral rail support on both sides. Uh, and then at discharge, he was able to do up and down 17 with supervision. Uh, with one rail support, he had informed us that he had one rail at his home and at his daughter's home where he was discharged to. Uh, so we obviously needed to practice that to make it more functional. Um, functional transfers, this includes sit to stand, you know, stand pivot. Uh, initially, he was contact guard min assist with the stand pivot and uh, sit to stand from pretty much all surfaces. Two weeks standby assist and at four weeks of discharge, he was modified independent with all transfers. Um, so he improved from the median fall risk category to the low fall risk according to the Berg. He was able to increase ambulation distance, increase with uh, all functional transfers, able to negotiate the amount of stairs and curbs that he needed to in the community uh, and at home. Um, and although he experienced improvements in most lower extremity joints, hip, knee, uh, and ankle, there was still deficits in the ankle. It wasn't as where I wanted to be. I kind of attribute that to being in the, the cam boot all the time. Um, some of the limitations of my study, uh, he was evaluated and treated before the intervention, meaning that he was evaluated by a different PT about nine visits before I arrived at the facility. So uh, when I got there, that's when I implemented the treatment, but I was not the one to evaluate. Uh, and he was treated by the other PT and he was treated by OT. OT was actually actually treated in the entire length of stay. Uh, Marwan, this is for you. <laughs> I regret the lack of manual treatment and stretching that I did not do. Um, when you're in a facility like that, you know, and you, you kind of start doing what some other people do as a student. Um, I think back and I really wish I would have done some more manual treatment, uh, even though I'm sure it would have, I don't know what it would have done with going back in the cam boot for another 20 hours. Uh, I wish I had more literature-based outcome measures. Uh, I, I really like the functional measures and I like the Berg balance. I would have liked to have done a tug, uh, timed up and go, maybe a six minute, uh, walk tests, um, and then also long-term effects after discharge from there to his uh, daughter's home. I don't, we don't know what he's doing now anything like that, so that's one of the limitations. Uh, and then future research, obviously the optimal rehabilitation protocol to return similar patients to their prior level of function, early weight bearing versus late weight bearing. That kind of goes along with the CAM boot protocol because I don't know, I really want to know why that he got put in the CAM boot with uh, no real indications that we knew about halfway through the intervention or maybe a quarter of the way through the intervention when he was already performing weight bearing, ambulating with no boot. Uh, so I um, really like to study the effects of the CAM boot on uh, functional outcomes. And then like I said, long-term effects of similar re rehabilitation protocols to see what it would be down the road, maybe a year, two years, even months. Here are my references if any of you would like to know any more about this. Uh, any questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. We uh, he we was discharged home with um, health care provided uh by his by his daughter and daughter's husband who were going to be around most of the day, and then we also asked for home health services um, because the occupational therapist and we felt he was a little impulsive sometimes. Um, so we re we recommended home health um, and then also outpatient outpatient or or home physical therapy uh, to continue what we had worked on.